Welcome, everyone, to the Asian Voices Radio podcast, where you'll find real Asian American conversations, including all the topics you were too afraid to ask your Asian parents. I'm your host, Linda Schwartz. My guest today is a woman of many talents. She's a performance artist, comedian, writer, and activist who is dedicated to making social change and impact through her artwork, comedy, and social statement. She's also an elected representative of Wilshire Center, Koreatown Subdistrict 5 Neighborhood Council, and founder of Auntie Sewing Squad, a remote factory turned national mutual aid collective at the start of the pandemic. It's my pleasure to welcome Christina Wong. Hi, Christina. Welcome. Oh, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) So, Christina, I'm so glad that you're here today. But before we get into all the good stuff. I kind of want to know what life was like before comedy and activism, um, before all of this happened. What was your What was your childhood like? I don't know which story like this. I don't think we have enough time for me to go through all this. But I will say, when people ask what my first performances were, I this is insane. You want real Asian American talk? Um, when I was a kid, there was a phone number for something called the Night Exchange that was passed around, and it was essentially for adults to meet each other through this sort of phone system. And it still exists, actually, I believe. It was free for women to call, but it costs for men. It costs men by the minute to call, and you would like create like a profile describing yourself like, Hey everyone. And this is like an example of a real profile I'd make because it's the phone. I'd be like, hi, I'm Cindy. I'm a 49ers cheerleader. I'm blonde with big boobs. And basically men would request to speak to me and then a saxophone would start playing saying, you have a phone request from Todd, right? Like, and these were my first performances. I was like, I got to separate myself from what I look like my age. This, this is complete, like, probably illegal catfishing and borderline to catch a predator. It was very to catch a predator except I wasn't a decoy of legal age. But, th- but that's who I was. I was like, you know, I, I'm, I grew up in San Francisco. I'm, um, my grandparents were the immigrants from China. So both my parents were born in San Francisco. And so sometimes even when people share or Asian Americans share stories about the immigrant experience, I can identify with some of it, but not all of it. Um, I was not the first in my family to go to college. I, um, my, my parents both went to college and sort of did that heavy lifting in terms of helping me navigate certain systems. But at the same time, I, I had to constantly learn uh, subconsciously how to repress parts of myself that were more Chinese, more foreign. And when it was interesting to people, um, (laughs) and play it up when it was interesting to people. And I remember my like very first boyfriend was this asshole named Brian Kenny went to all boys school. And literally like at that point, like no one was interested in me, but like he had told his white friend, like, oh, I've never dated an Asian before. And I was like, that's weird. But I also was like, oh, I have a chance. Like, so so stupid, right? <laughs> but like this, yeah. So, so there was a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. And a lot of it, I never quite figured out till I got to college, to UCLA, and was like, oh, there's a language, um, activism, and identity that can talk about this instead of kind of quietly swallowing these things that I've sort of have internalized as shameful or have just like learned to not speak up about. And um, I did theater in high school and and most of our plays were basically written by white men for white characters. Um, But San Francisco, uh, our high school is quite diverse. And so it was just like, this is how I sort of learned the arts was. It was like, you can only play someone who passes as white or, you know, you, you have to be sort of white passing to play these characters. Like what I do now is I, I write my own stories, perform them on stages. I'm the only performer. In fact, sort of something that sort of distinguishes my solo work from a lot of other solo work is not any actor can just pick up my script and do it. A lot of it is I perform a character named Christina Wong. 
So I took you through a lot of dirty stories just now, but that's basically like, I'm just a woman who couldn't find a therapist and wasn't allowed to go to therapy. Well, I love that. I love that, you know, it's experimental and you get to share the stories that you want to share. And I, I feel like there's a lot of agency in your work. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that I, what I do is so hard. The fact that I do this for a living is so crazy, right? Like it requires so much motivation, but I can't imagine what my actor friends deal with and they're constantly at the mercy of someone else picking them and, <laughs> and, to, and, and, and deciding they are appropriate for this role. Right. And, and like, just, there's so much more agency when you write your own work and play yourself for a living. Like if I sat around waiting for a network and I have had a television pilot, like waiting for a network to, Oh, we should develop a story about a Chinese American third generation woman who goes to Northern Uganda, makes a rap album with locals and explores her proximity, white privilege. Hmm. That's never going to happen, right? It hasn't happened yet. So I, but I, that's my show, The Wong Street Journal, which <laughs> a few shows ago that I toured, right? Like, so, um, yeah. So a lot of my shows now, it's like, I just sort of get myself into these crazy situations and, and reflect on it and tell it on stage. And what a lot of this character of Christina Wong has in common from show to show is I sort of play this self, this, this martyr named Christina Wong, who's like, hell bent on saving the world in simplistic ways and shit gets really complicated really fast. So my recent show, which I just finished off Broadway, Christina Wong's Wet Shop Overlord is about me starting the auntie sewing squad at the top of the pandemic. I, uh, my tour for my previous show, Christina Wong for public office was canceled. And I saw there was a need for homemade masks. I was deemed non-essential like most creatives were and was stuck at home. And I was like, I'm going to, fix this. I'm going to stop this pandemic on my sewing machine, on my Hello Kitty sewing machine. And um, 17 months later, I'm like commanding a fleet of 800 volunteer aunties around the country. We've made 350,000 masks that we've sent to vulnerable communities. Pandemic has not ended. <laughs> Suddenly we're doing relief drives to the Navajo Nation. Like it, this is sort of like, this is, this is sort of a constant theme in my life as I very naively decided to do something to make something better. But to stumble into how difficult it is. So not only did the Auntie Sewing Squad become the subject of my off-Broadway show, but we also have a book uh, published by University of California Press that has contributions from dozens of our aunties. It's called The Auntie Sewing Squ Squad Guide to Mask Making, Radical Care, and Racial Justice. Uh, it's a beautiful book. You should pick it up. And where can we get it? Uh, it's on Amazon and Target, which of all crazy places. Had I known it was going to be there, I would have written more about socialism. But I think at the core, besides like being a contribution and wanting to make a difference, um, there's this social activism that is wrapped around that. I definitely feel like at the top of pandemic, when I think about March 2020, how helpless I felt. And I've, I've definitely been in that place before. I remember the 2008 recession and post 9-11. I remember thinking... Oh God, it's all over. The sky is falling. Why do we? Bo why bother making art? Um, the, the capitalism uh, has not saved us, and now we're going to all die. And that did not happen. It was those are really rough times, but we we're still here. And so I think this time around, when I had seen that this pandemic was coming, and it seemed to really feel like it was heavy on the East Coast and slowly moving west. It, it really felt like there was this window where I could do something about it. But I I also sew a lot of my set pieces and props for my shows, and I never have made medical equipment. And so something felt really incredible about, wow, I have an essential skill. I've never in my life been in a position where I, I was the difference between life or death for someone. Like, you know, someone's like having a heart attack. They're not like, where's Christina Wong? Tell us a joke. Like, that's not <laughs> how that plays out. And yet here in this moment, I was like, oh my God, I could, I can fix this with sewing. So, so really for this particular last piece, which was both this mutual aid project, which became this incredible community of caring, it wasn't just a bunch of people sewing, but it was really a community that was taking care of each other. I think we really did feel like we could provide an immediate defense that, the government wasn't like, I really had thought we were just going to sew for 
two or three weeks. And then these theoretical masks in cargo ships coming from China would be distributed by the government to everyone. What I didn't realize was masks would somehow become politicized, that there would be politicians telling you not to wear masks, uh, actively advocating, you know, that you that that your freedom somehow had to do with with mask wearing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really, yeah, sometimes I really go get into this because I, I truly, whether it's delusion, being delusional or visionary, it's a very fine line for me, <laughs> whether I'm one or the other. Um, I really thought I could, you know, most of the time I really think that I can make a difference. And I think it's important for us to believe that we can make a difference, you know, whether or not we pull it off is another thing. So when was it then? Was there like an exact moment for Mm -hmm. you or when you started to reconcile within yourself that you needed to forge your own path? When I was 13, I became an avid environmentalist. And I talk about this in my show, Going Green the Wrong Way, because I was just sitting with the statistics. And this was like in the mid 90s, early 90s, like just how fucked we were as a planet. I think we're, you know, finally waking up like, oh, maybe we should do something about climate change. And yet we're so slow to it. And you know, as a 12, 13 year old, the immediate things I could reach around were like, well, I cannot use the air conditioner. I can, and it's very frustrating to figure out like our, our existences are toxic, right? Like (laughs) we all have carbon footprints, but you know, really the real answer is not that we need to like suffer and, um, walk around in potato sacks all day. I think it's, it, 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 it's hard to put a dent in the bigger thing, but I, I, I think I was really hit with, personal impact at that young age. And, and, and it wasn't until I got older in my 30s that I began to understand how to look at the environmental justice movement through the lens of racial justice and how it's it's not just about like, oh, you better compost or you're a bad person, but like really thinking about communities that are hit the worst um, when when shit goes down with the environment and and how uh, how, how to go at it, not just from a, we need to buy certain products that are greener, but really kind of think about economic justice and racial justice. Um, and so I'm, I guess that I tell this anecdote because I, I think it's important to understand that activism is something that I'm learning about. Like I, I don't, I don't, I didn't have all the answers. I know I was so overwhelmed when I got to college, when I got to UCLA and I, joined an Asian American theater company. And that was so profound to me to be like, wow, we're writing our own work. And this community, while sometimes the work would be quote unquote apolitical, like not a be about anything at all. It, it was just kind of amazing to see us acknowledge our experiences because I never really been okay or felt like it was okay to acknowledge that I was going through experiences that were specific to my identity and that were worth sharing. So, uh, but I was also just hit with the anger of how much I had repressed through most of my teenage life, all these little microaggressions of people like straight up, you know, coming up to me and saying, I've always had a thing for Asian women or, Oh, Asian, why are Asians so quiet? Tell me, Christina, you know, like, like, and not even being funny. Like they really, you know, think that I'm to answer that and uh, see that. Right. And, and I just was filled with so much rage. So, I mean, a lot of it comes from that, um, but also sort of recognizing that um, if we persist at the rate that capitalism wants us to go, uh, it's not good. Like there's a lot of people who are going to be miserable and poor and, and, I don't know. I, I, a lot of it's also looking at like what my parents, like bless them, bless them, bless my, bless my dear long suffering parents. But like, you know, they, they very much taught me like, um, you want to have a, a stable job doing this. And this is what success looks like. But I was never raised to be happy. Like I was only raised to be successful. And somehow that success was supposed to equate to joy. And, and, and the success had a very specific way it looked. It meant being able to say that I went to this medical school or got these sorts of grades or married this Chinese doctor, but it was never really about who I was and where I wanted to express myself. And, and that to me was so 
flustering and frustrating that it was like, I'm not in the eyes of, (laughs) in most of my community and family, I might not be considered real or valuable person based on this strange criteria. And, And to see how that's echoed out in capitalism and other um, false kind of ways of weighing value in this world, it, it just seemed very misery making. And, and um, yes, you could have a big, you know, corporation and yes, that makes you really successful, but are you paying your workers? Are you, <laughs> are, um, are people suffering? Or is, is stuff getting dumped in a river, you know, as a result? And, and, and so a lot of it was sort of just, trying to understand, like, can we find a new joy to find value in where we are right now instead of constantly feeling like I'm waiting for my life to start when I hit the certain level of success or these certain arbitrary markers that someone has set up for me. Yeah. And I love that. I mean, I love that you've been able to forge your own way and make your own path and create your own journey through this whole process. And, and, um, I want to, talk a little bit about how you got into comedy next, because I know you're, you're just so multifaceted. And, and I, after we talk about comedy, I'd love to hear about how you brought that all together to, and, and when it was for you that you really just said, this is it, I'm going to step forward and this is what I'm going to do. A lot of it was college, like picking a major, I can't re- when I think about it now, like there's so much ridiculous emphasis put on what's your major, what's your major, it's your destiny. And I remember really looking at creative majors like in theater and film, but also being terrified, like, oh my God, this means that I'm, you know, I'm I'm turning my back on on the six figure potential of a job in engineering or law or whatever that I ended up majoring in English and uh, world arts and cultures at UCLA, which is creative and performative. It's not theater. And I, I, I just, I remember calling my mother my first year of college and saying, you think that success is working for the same corporation for like 40 years, collecting a pension than retiring. To me, that seems so miserable, right. To, <laughs> to like, work the same place for the certain security, then quote unquote, retire and then live my life in my sixties. Like, isn't there a way to do something I enjoy and is stimulating for me personally, my whole life. And that's the choice I made. And it was hard, so hard in my twenties when, you know, I remember taking a job as a restaurant hostess um, the year after school and literally serving all the South campus majors, South campus is like science and steady stuff. Like basically they were all having meals with each other and I was literally serving them. And I was like, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't even making that much. I was making like 12 bucks an hour doing that. Um, oh, yeah. And I was like, oh man, I've like made my yeah. bed, but it doesn't have to be that way right there. And I think now we're seeing many more Asian creatives and and many other ways to make money outside the you know, work for someone else hourly model and, and that, that you, but this, I, I don't want to fall into this conversation of like hustle and capitalism again, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, that's, I think that's where I began to um, recognize uh, that I needed to, you know, it was going to be a scary thing. I was going to be basically building my own bridge under my feet as I kept walking and, and, and really having to trust that the ground would be there and that I wouldn't fall through the ground and crash. And there have been moments of little crashes. Um, there was multiple times in my twenties that I was like, okay, I'm going to leave my survival job and do work full time as an artist. And it didn't quite work. And I had to scramble for some sort of source of income. And, and at times got super desperate about how to find it. Um, But I will say that looking, you know, if if this version of me could talk to that version, I would have just said, just, you have to just keep going and know, you know, where you put your precious focus and just do it. And you're you're basically building the world you want to live in. And that's the difference between working for someone else and making sort of your own creative dream come true is like, there aren't a lot of examples. I, I was fortunate enough in Los Angeles that there were solo Asian American women artists that I looked up to um, 
that were make, that seem to be making a living and having a you know really creative existence making their work um but i also witnessed how sometimes that creative life was short lived and they'd maybe tour for two or three years then start a family and then they'd have to go find a job or you know it wasn't it's not consistent the way a job could be and that to me was a little scary. Like how did, (laughs) I'm not seeing that many examples. I don't have that, you know, mentors who can show me what a 40 or 50 year long career looks like. So that's stuff I've had to kind of figure out on my own. So I use the word comedian in my bio, but I'm not very much, I'm not like the stand up comedian who performs at clubs. And I know this is super confusing for a long time. When I got out of school, I was like, I'm going to be a performance artist. And what I had imagined was like a deep, brooding performance artist in a gallery, like covering myself in paint and feathers and screaming about oppression. Like that is actually more what I wanted to do with my creative life. But people would watch my quote unquote, what I thought were serious shows. And they'd be like, it's so funny. (laughs) It's like, what? And so I started to use the term comedian, because if you look at the history of comedy, it is not just stand up. It is, it can be very embodied and it's a whole history, but I think commercially how a lot of us understand comedy, it looks a very specific way, but I invite folks to look at the way, um, uh, like shows like the daily show, like they're dealing with some really intense topics using comedy. I look at Colbert who got us through the pandemic with no audience members and is talking about George Floyd is talking about hate crimes, but still, John Oliver is also another one, right? Um, So I feel like I started to have to use that term, one, because people were getting freaked out, like, what the fuck is a performance artist? But so the market could could identify (laughs) what it was I do. Um, But I began to just lean into thinking, okay, this is just what I do. I perform in theaters, and I can be very funny. But I'm also touching on some really deep stuff. uh, I mean, this most recent show, like it's, it sounds crazy. I'm a show called sweatshop overlord. <laughs> that should not be a funny show, right? Like sweatshops are terrible. A lot of it was, you know, I think, I think most artists over the course of the career, you should not be making the same kind of work year to year. If, if you want to be good at what you do, right? Like you, you really should be challenging yourself and, and discovering new things you've never done before and not just phoning in the thing you've done that works. And, um, and that's what I feel like I'm doing show after show is, is like this show looked this way. This one looked that way. My next project, I'm trying to build a food bank. That's a performance space, right? Like it's so strange. I don't know how the hell I'm going to do it, but, but I think, um, yeah, this is <laughs> this is just sort of how I go about doing work of late. I, I love it. And um, tell me a little bit about how like it all kind of came together. Was there a moment where you just kind of said, this is it, this is what I want to do? And um, or was it just trial and error? I, I feel like obviously like there seemed to have been a process, but um, can you talk about that moment where you were kind of like, I'm going all in on my dream. Oh, there's so many all in moments. Um, I mean, yeah, every time I made a decision that pulled me further and further away from a normal path, I remember there was a moment where someone, uh, the, the mo I, I was about six years out of school when I finally didn't found myself. Oh, I don't have to do side jobs that aren't related to my work anymore. <laughs> and that and then I, and that's, that's when I was touring Wong Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was a show about depression and suicide. It was hard. I was I was not paying myself very much, but it was enough to pay my rent and survive. And I remember like a year went by, two years went by, and it was sort of a moment where it's like, oh shit, I'm too Googleable at this point to go apply for a straight job. I think that's different now. And now I realize in LA, like especially with like. If I wanted to get a job at a restaurant, like right now, I probably could do that, but I don't, I don't think I'm built for that. Um, <laughs> but I was sort of like a moment where I'm like, oh my God, I can't go back. And, um, and there, and it was actually a quite scary moment because I, 
I had never seen success. Now I have, you know, with these more recent shows, um, but Wong Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest toured on and off for eight years. And I sort of got stuck creatively. I tried to make two new shows. Some of them sort of toured, but not really. And I began to wonder like, oh, is my only value to the world? And this was negative self-talk. I was very isolated. Um, Cause I'm by myself most of the time, you know, uh, at home or when I'm on tour, or maybe I just have one technician and I, and lonely, super lonely. And I was like, is my only value to the world talking about depression? And I began to convince myself, maybe it was, maybe I'm just an ambulance chaser who shows up in communities after a student has committed suicide and um, became very cynical and, uh, and, and was like, well, do I quit this profession? But then I was like, oh my God, I feel like I'd have to start all over again. I haven't had a job job in years and I wouldn't even know what to do. Like what, <laughs> what would I be qualified for this many years out of a regular job market? And that, so that was a terrible time. I went to Northern Uganda. This is how I sort of fixed it. Is I was like, I'm going to go to Uganda and have the Peace Corps experience that most people have out of college at 35. And <laughs> write a new show called the Wong street journal. And so I ended up making a rap album with local rappers wow. by accident. And that taught the process it of making like I, a happy accident. It was a, it was a wonderful accident. It's, it was a lot to witness. I will say I, I'm not, you know, I don't want to create this illusion that was just like, Oh, all these, all these, all, all right. these Africans surrounded me and helped me find myself. Like it's, it's a lot of what, when I came back, I realized, Oh, this is very complicated. Me as an Asian American telling the story of what my experience in someone else's country was mm -hmm. like. Um, and, but it was a, it was so different than writing a show about my pain and my past and my depression mm -hmm. or whatever that, that it taught me, all right, this is how you're going to approach stuff from now on. You're going to yeah. take on stuff. You have no idea how to do and do it. So, uh, yeah, the one, like kind of yeah. Said Took you outside of yourself. Absolutely. The Wong Street Journal did that. And then the show after that was Christina Wong for Public Office, where I took a few stabs at trying to write about her political moment in the last, you know, during the last president. And uh, <laughs> and it was really hard, like how to write satire when we were living in satire times. And I was woke up one morning and was like, I'm just going to run for office because politicians and artists seem to have switched jobs anyway. Um, you know, like they're the ones who are being the clowns. And, and we as artists are trying to, you know, create some sense of normalcy around this. Yeah. And so I ran, I looked into how to run for office. I, I ran for my neighborhood council, an unpaid position, one, and that was that show. And then Auntie Sewing Squad was something I wasn't even expecting to do a show on. But <laughs> the pandemic sort of threw us into a situation where we were uh, sewing masks and making medical equipment. You know, as people have never done that before. And and that became this, you know, everyone lived through the pandemic, but I would say what our how the aunties and our experience was different was we 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 sort of became these first responders you don't hear about. And yeah. we were literally sending masks to the communities that were getting the hit the worst by the pandemic because of structural racism, because of systemic violence. And so these were black communities and indigenous communities and farm mm -hmm. workers and migrants at the border that we were sending our masks to. Amazing. Yeah. Well, we're coming up at the top of our time together, but I wanted to ask you about your, the show that you're doing now, the food bank show. How did this come about? <laughs> and is, when are you going to start touring? Are you taking it out? Tell us, tell us. Yeah. So this right now, I think it might be called Christina Wong food bank influencer. And I, right before the pandemic started, somehow wandered into the world harvest food bank in Los Angeles. It's at Benison Arlington. Didn't, I thought it was just a market and it's a food bank. That's also a market. So if you're not on public assistance, I'm not on public assistance. I do have a lot of friends who are, um, you can buy a heaping cart of food for $40, which wow. is crazy when you think about how much prices have gone up heaping oh. shopping cart of food. Uh, but they also do food giveaways and stuff like that. And they get really good stuff. They get sashimi grade fish. Oh. It's shifted a bit in the pandemic. They don't, <laughs> they, they don't get as good stuff as they did. They did right before the pandemic, but there's really good stuff there. And I just began to like, just spread the word about this place. And I joked around like, 
most of my stuff starts with me making a stupid joke that just becomes real life. But I was like, I am a food bank influencer. The Kardashians are beauty influencers and I'm a food bank influencer. I became a best, I became one of a, a best friend to Glenn Corrado who started the food bank. And, um, I just, I just like cannot, I tell him like, I don't have a personality anymore. I just talk about this food bank and how amazing it is. And during the pandemic, all the aunties knew about the food bank because we were sending expired coffee from the food bank to them basically as ways to kind of keep them awake at their sewing machines. Yeah, yeah. And I was sending coffee, expired coffee all over the Navajo nation. And I just, I don't know. It got me like looking at his food bank and, and, uh, and, and, and how incredible it is and looking at how much food waste there is. I, I'm, I'm just really interested in figuring out how to make another one of those in a performative way. I'm going to be the artist in residence at ASU Temp, uh, Gamage, uh, which is in Tempe, Arizona. And I have three years to sort of develop this project there. Wow. So well, congratulations on that's that. What, <laughs> that's what that is. Sorry for these that long sounds, answers. Oh, it sounds, no, it sounds <laughs> like you're up to amazingly big things and, you know, I, I, I see you. Thank I you. I see you. you. I, I literally Bro. see you. I know. I see you too. So, <laughs> I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Christina, for joining us. To learn more about Christina, you can visit ChristinaWong.com, and that's Christina with a K. If you have any suggestions for future guests or topics, we'd love to hear from you. Asian Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers our API community with a voice through media arts. If you would like to support our program and make a donation, please visit AsianVoicesRadio.com. Thank you for listening. I'm Linda Schwartz. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Voices radio show. Until then, take care, everyone.